Welcome everyone to our Strictly Social Coffee Hour. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us at this time uh, to share with you the next hour and some interesting discussion with our special guest. I wanna begin by thanking our sponsors. As you will see on the screen before you, there are a number of them and we're extremely grateful um, that they are with us to support us and as you can see, as I mentioned just a second ago, too many to mention, but please know how much we appreciate. Without your support, we would not be bringing this program as well as many others to you and for you. So again, we thank you. Here are a few thoughts I wanted to share with you as we set up today's program. Uh, and before I introduce our very special guest, we had 150 of you sign up to be a part of this program. Uh, you all are muted uh, for purposes that are obvious, as we have learned by using uh, virtual media, that we have a tendency sometimes to talk over each other unintentionally. And to avoid that, we do have you on mute, but clearly there is a chat box, as you will see. So please, uh, as guests, to enter your questions, and we'll be sure, if time allows, to be able to share it with our four leaders. With that, I am especially pleased to have with us uh, and to welcome our four leaders, leaders of the 129th legislative session. Let me say that they all share the title of assistant leaders uh, in both branches, the House and the Senate of their respective parties. But I can tell you, I haven't experienced um, with each of them that they would be leaders, they are leaders, whether they carry the title or not. We are very grateful they're with us. So let me introduce them to you. First of all, in the Senate, the Assistant Majority Leader, Eloise Vitelli, the Assistant Minority Leader, Jeff Timberlake. In the House, we're pleased to have the Assistant Majority Leader, Ryan Fecto, and the Assistant Minority Leader, Trey Stewart. To each and every one of you, we thank you very much. And so let's get on with today's coffee hour. Let's begin by stating the obvious perhaps. In January, we all began the second session as has been normally the case of uh, the 129th. It began with a very ambitious agenda. There were, in our opinion, an unusual number of very important significant bills that were up for consideration. Um, many of them created opportunities for us. Others we saw as challenges that needed to be addressed. We started in earnest, marching forward to that expected adjournment date of mid-April, only to have it come to a halt. And that happened on March the 12th when our first case of coronavirus was brought to our attention. And five days later, Coincidentally, on St. Patrick's Day, the cham they, both chambers of the legislature put all of their differences aside and in a bipartisan move adjourned the legislature, still with a number of issues still remaining for consideration, many of which were important to each and every one of you as well as your peers. So while that was only seven weeks ago, it seems like to many of us it was seven months ago. So my first question is, so that we don't forget something that was important in those first two and a half months, I ask each of you and Senator Vitelli, I'll start with you, followed by Jeff Timberlake and then go to the House. What, what was that issue? What was that initiative that you acted upon in those first two and a half months that you feel was significant that you'd like to share with us on this particular moment? Well, thank you very much, Dana. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, getting to be a familiar experience, life on Zoom, uh, seeing everybody in their little boxes. <laughs> I see some familiar yeah. faces, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, and you're right, this, the seven weeks does seem like it's a lot longer ago that we were all together in Augusta. Um, but in answer to your question, what I think back on that I'm most pleased we actually accomplished before we were hit with this pandemic was my, the Student Loan Bill of Rights that I sponsored and had worked on for a number of years, actually, 
we finally got that passed and implemented um, and gives borrowers, student loan borrowers, access to basic consumer protections so that as they strive to pay back their student loans, they, have, they know that they are doing it right and that they're not being taken advantage of and that they have somebody in their corner if things do go wrong. So I was really, really pleased that we were able to get that passed and implemented. Um, I, I was also pleased most recently to hear that as part of the uh, coronavirus response at the federal level, some uh, loan servicers are actually putting their uh, borrowers in forbearance for a period of time. So this has been a really important economic issue in our state and elsewhere. The amount of student loans, student debt that's out there has been crippling some people's ability to fully participate in the economy. So I think that was one of our accomplishments that I'm really pleased we were able to put forward so that going forward and as we start to get into the recovery phase of this, um, people will have something that they can rely on as they try to restructure their financial lives. Indeed. So that's what I would point to. Well, thank you. Uh, Senator Timberlake. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you again for inviting me to participate today. I look forward to it. Thank you for the question. I look back over the uh, last couple of years about, you know, what was the great accomplishments that, that we got done? And, and some of them were that, you know, with some of the legislation that we prevented, but some of the things that we accomplished, look back at, was at the very end, we get on the transportation bond and the, the, uh, the infrastructure state of very crucial to our economics, the moving of our products, the moving of the tourists in and out of the state. And I just see that as something that has to happen, especially now that's what's happened in the last seven weeks of with the revenues that are coming in and just the transportation industry alone, the less travel, uh, how much money we're down, uh, hearing of roads, out of the gas tax and fuel tax and so forth. So uh, I look at, at the broadness was come together and find a solution for the transportation and infrastructure in the state of Maine. And I think that in, is, you know, an accomplishment that we get for you know, we'll talk about some other stuff along the way, but that's what I look as a bright spot. Yep. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Now let's turn to the House and um, Majority Leader uh, Ryan Fecto. What was your issue? Uh, well, thanks, Dana. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be a participant in this morning's event. Um, and it's great to see so many people uh, participating. I should uh, clarify up front, as the governor noted yesterday, uh, during the press conference uh, about her hair. I'll note that uh, I also have not seen uh, a hairstylist in the last several weeks, but I cut my own hair. So uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I look a little clean right now, but that's because I, I did it myself. Um, so I, I felt like that was an important clarification. I, I don't have any special access to anyone uh, in, in the profession. Um, you know, I was really proud of a lot of things that we accomplished over the, the two year session um, you know, I think w one thing that I, I, I take great pride in is I think that um, the, two, the two major parties in the legislature um, worked really well together. Um, I, I think that restored trust and um, um, really being able to collaborate a lot more than what I had seen in the, my first four years in the legislature um, was a point of pride. Uh, personally, um, I had a bill that made uh, one of the single largest investments and affordable housing that passed this session was signed by the governor. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. I think it's really important, especially now, to be talking about affordable housing and ensuring that main stock continues to increase. And I, and I look forward to the, the next eight years as this bill uh, takes effect, that we are able to increase housing stock um, across the state and including in, in rural Maine. Um, as you may know, there was a federal provision that was set to expire. Um, and this bill helped protect the number of those units um, in rural parts of the state that would have otherwise um, have gone back to market rate, um, impacting uh, residents um, in, a, in a huge way. And so 
Uh, I'm glad that we were able to get that bill passed when we did. I'm glad it wasn't uh, a bill that was still lingering uh, in the in the days before we we had to abruptly adjourn. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, the work ahead. Uh, it's it's not going to be easy. Uh, we have a lot of challenges before us, uh, but I think that this group of of legislators, uh, Republicans and Democrats, can uh, can work together to 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 do good for the state. I would agree with that as well. Um, Minority Leader Trey Stewart. Hey Dana, thank you uh, for the invitation this morning. It's good to see. I flipped through the list, saw a lot of familiar faces of uh, those that logged on. So welcome and good morning. I hope you're all well and healthy and and finding. Uh, some productivity in, in all of this uh, as we move to an online setting. Um, you know, we, I, I, first of all, I got to say, you know, I'm glad that Ryan brought up the, the affordable housing tax credit bill because uh, that's, that's a big one. Uh, I, that was on my list of if it hadn't gotten mentioned yet, definitely going to bring it up because that was a good win for the state of Maine. Um, you know, I think um, big picture, the big, the big one, you know, in the first year, uh, the budget is, is usually the number one uh, big ticket item for the legislature. And in the second year, it's typically bonds. And so uh, I know Senator Timberlake mentioned uh, the, uh, the transportation bond. Obviously, broadband is a big deal. And that was a part of that, uh, that bond package, as the governor referred to it, the connections package. And so um, that's a big deal for the state of Maine, particularly rural Maine. Um, you know, I think right now you're going to see a spotlight get put on um, the places that don't have uh, broadband access. Uh, and so this is a good time, I think, to be making those critical investments going forward because we are going to have a lot of data after this. And that's sort of one of the silver linings. Um, you know, that's what I've been trying to do is look at what are the silver linings? What can we glean from this opportunity here um, to shift to a, to a, a digital environment, even if it's temporary? Uh, what can we learn from this going forward to make the investments that we need so that if we have to do that again at some point in the future, uh, we're well prepared as a state and as a community uh, to be able to weather those those future storms uh, as much as some may not want to think about it. I think if, if you're in public service, you have to you know hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, and so uh, trying to pick up as much information and data from all this as we can, is going to be critical going forward. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that that bond package is a big deal. Yeah, and, and I thank all four of you because you have reminded us that while we're totally consumed as one would expect and uh, would want us to be with the coronavirus is that you brought to our attention some very significant things that affect both our lives and our livelihood that with time we tend to forget because of the overwhelming nature of this pandemic. So I thank you for that. Now, uh, let's fast forward here. Um, there are a number of issues that didn't get dealt with that were important to, I'm sure, each and every one of you. Um, and we also have uh, a budget concern that we all um, are concerned about. And I guess my question speaks to what's next. Do you, what's your best guess in terms of a special session? And as a follow-up to that, do you think that there is room in that special session, if we have one, uh, to deal with issues that weren't dealt with, or will it be all attention on the coronavirus impact on the budget that we all know is going to be pretty dramatic, um, to say the least? What's your best hey, guess? Hey, Dana, I'm sorry to interrupt. Before we do that, can I just do one piece of housekeeping that we didn't do at the beginning? And that is, as people listen, and if you have questions, then there's a chat function at the bottom of the screen, and you can input your questions into the chat box, and we'll loop around at the end and ask our, our, our legislative uh, representatives that question. Sorry to interrupt, but I didn't want to lose the opportunity for people to ask questions. So go ahead. Gave me time to think about your answer. Go for it. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a big question, Dana. <laughs> Actually, there were several questions wrapped into that one. And I don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. Um, but my guess is that we'll likely have a special session at some point. There's a lot of issues. We've already mentioned some of them that we will have in front of us as we move towards recovery and rebuilding. The good news is we left the state budget in good shape. 
We were talking about this earlier. There is more money in the rainy day fund now than there has been ever historically. Some 250 million Senator, uh, represent, yeah, Senator Timberlake has the exact number. He can give us that. We also left about $190 million on the table. So there's resources there. We're likely gonna need it. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen that we've already talked about here that we're gonna continue, we're gonna need to continue to focus on is the need for infrastructure, broadband in particular. Um, our businesses, all of us are becoming more and more dependent on those kinds of interconnections. So there's no question in my mind that that's gonna continue to be one of our priorities. I think education is gonna be another one that we will continue to have to focus on to make sure that our kids can continue their education and in some fashion or other. And we need to clearly make sure that our businesses, our entrepreneurs, our farmers, fishers, fishermen, et cetera, um, can re-engage in their efforts to get our economy uh, recharged and, and bringing income into, into our community. So those are some of the fundamentals, I think, that we will be addressing um, when we get back, whenever that might be. And I'll, I'll let my colleagues add to that, but I think that's part of what I see in front of us. And, uh, yes. yes. Um, and thank you, Senator Botelli. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's a great question. And will we go back? I don't see how we don't go back. It's a matter of when we go back. I know that the governor has uh, indicated that she's calling the Revenue Forecasting Committee back in in June and July to give us more accurate numbers. And I suspect after that um, will be when we come back into session to deal with whatever, whatever shortfalls we have coming up. Um, you know, we'll get revenue numbers in another week or two for the end of May. And we kind of know that that's in bad shape already for the numbers that we've been getting out of, uh, out of down at OFPR. But... I look at, you know, the special session, I get, I get nervous because I get concerns about, you know, we still got um, a couple hundred bills left out there on the table that are hanging around. And my concern would be that when we go back in that we don't start, you know, stripping uh, funds off them and move them in out, out years of the state of Maine, that we deal with just the things we have to deal with. And then, and then we go back home because um, this is a time when, when businesses my family, you know, I'm a farm boy out of turn, eight generation farmer. And I look at what all my neighbors are doing. I got two telephone calls yesterday from, from people crying about losing their businesses and they can't get on unemployment. So I think we got to go back and deal with some stuff to get Maine going again. But I truly believe that when we go back, it's got to be very limited, probably deal with curtailments in state government where we're heading, you know, Governor Mills has put out a hiring freeze, except for emergencies, uh, no extra spending, all those things. I think that's a very good idea. But I do see that we're going to have to go back and deal with some issues. What they are, I don't think anybody knows at this point in time exactly what they are. But I think that we have some issues that are going to need to be dealt with. And I think it's going to be hard sledding for all of us when we get there. Thank you. Representative Fecto? Yeah, I don't think I have much more to add to the to the conversation. I think, you know, I think, again, likely that there's a special session. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we're talking about a, a three-month special session. I think we're talking about a, a session that is, is very limited and, and tight. Um, and will that allow us to take up a bunch of the bills that uh, were left over from, from the second session? Maybe uh, it allows us to take up some of them. I, I don't think... Uh, I, I do think it'll be challenging to run um, the, the, the entirety of what was left, but, you know, I think we have to really dive in and look at, you know, what bills are still relevant. Um, you know, COVID-19 has changed the landscape for all of us and um, bills that were relevant prior to the, the pandemic uh, might not be relevant or applicable after the pan uh, uh, during this pandemic. So, um, I think we really have to take a, a deep dive as to what's what's there, and then in addition to that, what needs to be added um, in order for us to properly address um, the impacts that the pandemic has had on the state of Maine. So, um, 
you know, I think we have an obligation as leaders to find solutions. And uh, I think Senator Timberlake uh, made, made an important reference, you know, having, having the forecasting committee uh, reconvene and provide us with some direction as to what we're, what we're faced with, um, I think will really inform the work of the legislature. And, I, and, and that will be a significant um, uh, piece of the puzzle for, for all of us. Thank you. Uh, Representative Stewart. Thanks, Dana. Um, so I, I was on a call this morning earlier um, uh, on the Board of Visitors for UMPI, and so we were talking about what the game plan is for, for UMPI, and, and you know, part of that discussion is the fact that you know, higher ed is, is generally looking at the fall with still a lingering question of we don't know if we'll even be able to open come August, right? And so, and of course, this is a campaign year, right? That's the big elephant in the room. Um, but I know a lot of folks um, are going to be, you know, wanting to be home in their own districts for obvious reasons. Um, it's going to be, you know, tough to, to find a large chunk of time to pull everybody into there. And we don't even know at that point if it's going to be safe. And so if you've got an election in, uh, you know, November, it probably needs to happen sometime before October. Um, but we're not sure, you know, higher ed is saying as of today, we, we really don't know if that's feasible. Um, speaking of higher eds, uh, you know, they're, they're an organization that was on the forefront, really took it on the teeth financially because they had to refund a lot of the um, uh, tuition payments from students. And so, you know, the word uh, bailout comes to mind in terms of uh, those institutions. There's going to be a lot of uh, um, organizations and groups across the state that are going to be in need of financial assistance from the state. And that list gets longer and longer by the day. And so in terms of the specific bills, anything that costs money, I don't think makes sense to even consider at this point, uh, because we, we really are gonna have a, a pretty serious financial mess on our hands. You know, we've got uh, about 250 million in the rainy day fund right now, um, but you know, the monthly spending for the state of Maine is over 300 million. And so if you really, you know, spread that out, we don't know what that, we don't know what we don't know yet is what it boils down to. Um, and so I, I don't feel comfortable talking about any bills at all until we see what the forecast is. Um, and then we're, you know, we got to look at the list of, of folks that uh, are, are already under financial strain that are going to be viewed as a priority. Um, and so that's sort of what, you know, again, I, I think Ryan's right. If, if we do do a special session, it's going to be short, condensed, and we're going to have our list figured out hopefully before we get there, that way we can get in and out um, and, and mitigate exposure. I mean, the, the risk of the legislature going into session is that we come from every corner of the state. And so if one person has it, then we could be the reason that there's a spike in August. And so we, you know, that's the last thing anybody, anybody wants to be responsible for, particularly as public servants, we don't want to harm our communities in any way. So I'm sure that until it's actually safe, um, we're not going to have that discussion. And at least that's the message I've been hearing from the governor's office whenever she talks about it. Well, th well thanks to all of you for uh, your very candid response. And uh, we'll all find out pretty soon as whether or not your estimates are spot on. And now let's turn to the issue that has overwhelmed all of us since that time in early March. And we've gone from awareness that we weren't relieved of this challenge. We were a part of the challenge. Then we went to relief pro, uh, programs, both at the state level as well as the federal level. Now we move into that phase, which is really about reopening the economy. Um, in your opinion, it's a wide open question. What is it going to take, in your opinion, to reopen the economy? What must we deal with? How do we go about that task? We've heard the governor um, last Thursday at a press conference speak to four principles that, that were fundamental and necessary. She hinted yesterday, as a matter of fact, when it came to a question relevant to opening uh, some of the events like the Lobster Day in Rockland, that there would be guidelines by June. And to everyone's expectation today, it appears that she'll be adding some clarity to that very question. But from your point of view, what's it gonna take? What do we need to deal with? Well, I go back to something that I said to my kids forever, which is safety first. Whatever you're about to do to go out there, your safety, your health has to come first. 
And so I, I'm looking forward to hearing more from the governor about the guidelines that, that she and her team have, have put together. I think the more specific they can be, the better we'll all be able to adapt um, to whatever they are as we start to move forward. I've appreciated Dr. Shaw's image of this isn't a, an on-off switch that we're talking about, but rather more like a dimmer switch. So we're gonna gradually reinstate um, activities. So there's a lot of specificity in there that I think will help guide us forward. Really important because there's also a lot that we just don't know still about this disease, about how it gets transmitted, you know, so we need to take steps based on what we do know and make sure that it's clear and specific um, and be flexible as we do get more information and can and learn more, we can adapt further. I will say that one of the things that's encouraged me in this process as we start to contemplate reopening is the very creativity and innovation that I've seen in my community, and I'm sure it's replicated elsewhere, on the part of the small businesses as they've already started to adapt to the changing circumstances. The curbside pickup systems that people have instituted, um, I think have shown there's a real willingness to do what's necessary to keep people safe and to still engage in enterprise. And so I think we need to really be able to tap into that. Um, Mainers have always had a strong sense of entrepreneurial energy and creativity, and that's what it's gonna take. That's what we're gonna need to look to in order to make these adjustments <coughs> as we go forward. It's not gonna be business as usual. Um, whatever that was, if any of us can remember, it's going to be a changed way of doing business and we're going to need to pull on the creative energies that are out there in order to make it work. Senator Timberlake. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's a great question because I think it's, uh, we have to start working towards getting Maine restarted again, the economy in the state of Maine. I think it was mentioned earlier somewhere that, you know, Maine entertains somewhere around 36 million tourists a year. And without that industry, um, the state of Maine is basically going to go to dire straits because, you know, it supports not only the farming industry, but all the businesses up and down the coast. And I don't care whether you're talking about the furniture store or the local country store. These folks make their money during the summer um, with these people here. And without them here, they're not going to have enough money to make it through the winter. So, yes, we have to be very safe. I think people... If we've learned anything out of this is people have learned how to social distance when they're shopping. People have learned how to be careful about what they pick up. I, you know, they've learned to carry the sanitizers and do the things with them. And the fact of the matter is there are people like me who are gonna to have to be extra cautious because you know, I have a very high rate of, of catching diseases that wouldn't be good for me. So, I mean, some people are gonna to have to be a little more cautious in, in others, but I, I think that we have to work on a first strategic, flexible plan to get Maine moving again, because if we don't, um, we're potentially looking at a year and a half, because it's not just about the end of this summer. If we don't have a decent economy by sometime in June, if we don't start moving Maine towards, I don't, I don't mean it's going to get to normal by any stretch of the imagination, but if we can't, people start, can't, can't start to feel safe about doing some things, very concerned, the failure of businesses along the coast of Maine, tourism areas, interior, I, I just seeing a disaster that could portray out of it. And then they're not going to make it through the winters. And next summer is going to roll around and they ain't going to have the money to start up and get going. And so I'm really concerned. So uh, I'm encouraged to hear that the governor is going to come out today with uh, hopefully some plans that, that starts moving this forward. You know, I consider it like a great big freight train. You know, you got a, you got a hundred cars hooked on the back of the train, um, and you got a train with one car hooked on. When you give the train with one car hooked on, you give it the gas, it takes off. Well, we're going to have a hundred cars, and it's going to be very slow moving as it pulls out of the station. But eventually, we'll we'll hope our train gets up to speed somewhere along the way, cautiously and carefully. But 
um, we've got to get this train rolling out of the station at some point in time, or there may not be time for people in the state of Maine to get to where we got to go. And I, I just think it's of the utmost importance that we look at, we talked about when we started about flattening the curve, keeping the curve flat. We have done that. We've accomplished that. You know, we now, yesterday and the day before, we had more recoveries than we had cases. And I just think this is the time that we have to start looking at it. And that's my thoughts, and I'll move forward with that. Good. Representative Fecto? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the governor laid out a few, a few really critical points. The first was, as uh, Senator Vitelli mentioned, was, you know, safety first, the making sure that people, making sure that when we do reopen, um, whether it be partial reopening or, or, or you know, opening with, with some similarities to what we experienced before this pandemic, um, you know, safety has to be uh, front, front and center. And then healthcare preparedness, you know, making sure that whatever reopening looks like, that we uh, maintain the ability of our healthcare system to be uh, prepared and ready if, if there's another surge in cases. Um, and then I, I think she also mentioned uh, the public part, the public private partnership um, that, that I think is really critical to this as well. So, you know, I operate uh, a retail store in, in uh, a coastal uh, town here, here in Maine. We are thinking about these things all the time and we're also getting creative. You know, Senator Vitelli mentioned creativity. We've been hosting uh, virtual Facebook shopping events on Saturday mornings. Um, and I think this past Saturday, we probably had like 15 sales or so. And I think thir 13 out of the 15 were folks from Massachusetts. So our customers that are used to coming up on, on, a, on a weekend uh, to, to a gunkwit were purchasing their, their items virtually with us um, <clears throat> online and we were shipping the items to them. So, you know, finding ways to do things differently right now, that, you know, does that one day a week make up for the six days we're closed? Absolutely not. Um, but, it, but it's a surge. It gives us a shot in the arm, some money to allow us to maybe bring in inventory that we have held off on get, uh, receiving to start our season. Uh, so it's things like that that really, you know, I think we, we all need to be thinking of ways that um, allow us to be a little bit more creative. But there's also things that I think um, can allow us to reopen. So, for example, you know, um, in, in a gunkwit, you can't have items on the sidewalk. Um, you can't have, you can't do, you can't put merchandise out on, uh, out, uh, out in front of your store. Um, I think open air markets, uh, something of that nature is going to be really important um, to, to retail stores. There are going to be people who don't want to come inside a store. Um, they're going to be afraid to go inside a store. And so um, for us, you know, a small shop, we also probably will be limited in the number of people that we can have. We're, we're used to having 50 people jammed in our store in the middle of the summer, people packed on trolleys coming down into Perkins Cove. That's not going to be the reality. And so how do we make adjustments that allow uh, a store like, like mine and others in, in a gunkwit and across the state to function, but in a way that is, that is um, safe for our customers and for our employees, which, you know, is a huge concern for, for me, you know, thinking about how we make sure that our employees remain safe, what, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of protocols we need to put in place that ensure their safety and, and, and also the, you know, the safety of our, of our business as well. We, we don't want to put anyone at, at risk uh, uh, of this and making sure that every, everyone is safe in, 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 the, in the workplace. So um, there are a, I think there are a lot of things to figure out, uh, but I think we are at a point where we need to start answering these questions and, and providing a, 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 a blueprint to how we reopen the economy. Great. Representative Stewart? Thanks. Um, so for those that don't know, I'm from up in the county and, um, you know, we've got, um, well, up until a week ago, we only had one active case and now we're up to three. But I mean, the county is bigger than, you know, the entire state of Rhode Island and Connecticut combined. And so, um, you know, what might work in the county is probably not going to work in Cumberland. And so I think the, the regional approach is necessary. Um, I think looking at, you know, by an industry approach, I really... Uh, Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I really uh, think that the, the uh, President Trump had the right approach in forming a, a task force or a commission to specifically look at what innovative ways can we do this, but let's put something down on paper, right? And I think Ryan's right that we need to, we, you know, <clears throat> we've, we've been thinking about it a lot. Now it's time to actually come up with a plan. 
and uh, and get something out to folks that, that are, are really suffering right now. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are hurting really hard right now from the decision that the government made in the best interest of the people to shut things down. But you have to have a plan to get things going again. And I think the absence of the plan has been a, a, a big point of heartburn for a lot of folks um, that really they're, they're not necessarily seeing as much out of Augusta as they would like to in order to feel comfortable again, that there is going to be a strategy to get things going again. Um, you know, a lot of talking points, but again, there's nothing that pen to paper component is, is really missing. So um, I hope that, you know, we reached out to the governor's office, our caucus did on a couple different occasions, you know, really advocating for some sort of either task force or working group or stakeholder group, whatever you want to call it, um, to first of all, listen to what's happening across the state. Because what's happening up here is not necessarily the same thing that's happening in Southern Maine. And so um, getting those viewpoints from uh, various business owners and, and employers across the state uh, and being able to tap into that innovation that Senator Vitelli talked about. I mean, these folks are, you know, they know their business better than anybody else, certainly better than the government. Uh, and they should be able to be heard throughout this process. You all... Um express your thoughts extremely well. And I think that it, it, they are all statements that we hear echoed at this time throughout the state. I've noticed that we have uh, several questions in the chat box and I've asked our advocacy team to each take one of those. And so let's begin with you, Peter. What do you have? Well, first I have to unmute myself. Um, the first question we got asked actually came in um, uh, to our office ahead of time. And it's a conversation that, or it's a question that deals with our public health system. Um, and the question is this, with the impact of COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, would the state ever consider funding the creation of a county or regional, of county or regional health departments? as a way to have a more localized approach to addressing public health concerns like infection control, chronic disease prevention, health inspections, et cetera. So that's the question. That's the first question. Do any of you want to take a stab at that? Um, Dana, I could say that I, I talked to our uh, director of emergency response uh, up here, Darren Woods. Um, that's essentially his job is to work with uh, the CDC for, for the be a, point of contact uh, for the county, Aroostook County, um, and then help to disseminate information um, to all the various hospitals, all the, all the organizations that are continuing to do that, that uh, public health work. Um, so I think we've sort of got that um, already pre-existing. It's not, you know, I guess I'm not really sure exactly what type of organization this person is looking for, but there are organizations that sound similar to that that are working hard uh, to make sure that folks have uh, a county by county breakdown and, and the information is flowing out from Augusta and into the counties. Yeah, I would second that, uh, Trey. We One of the first things I did in this um, pandemic is pull together our, our county resources. And we've been holding weekly meetings with our county emergency management coordinator, our uh, local law enforcement, our sheriff, and all of the legislators, really trying to look at how best to coordinate the response, uh, both from a health perspective, but also sort of some of the other emergency issues that have come up, like getting food distributed to the folks who need it and so on. So I you know, is there more that could be done on a county or regional basis to, to coordinate services and to make sure there are resources that are, that are needed or there? Probably, um, you know, we, we had a big push this last session to make sure that our public health nurses were fully up to speed and were available uh, to play their part in um, responding to and controlling uh, disease outbreaks, we still need to do more there from what I understand. So um, yeah, there, there, there are some systems that are already in place and probably one of the lessons from this experience is that we need to make sure that they're more robust and more uh, efficient in functioning in their coordinating role. My answer would be to it. I haven't, uh, I personally hadn't given a lot of thought. I ain't gonna lie about it. Um, it's not something that um, I really took at the 
county level so much that the CDC has been handling that since it started in the very beginning. Um, we have a couple hospitals in Androscoggin County where, where I represent that do a real good job of getting together and somewhat working together. I use the word somewhat sometimes because sometimes they compete against each other. But in this case, I think they've done a good job of working together. And I think the important part of the public health sector, though, is I'm concerned about our hospitals that they have in, in our area, we've had CMMC, which has laid off, I think, 300 people because they're not taking in any new patients. And the, the pandemic, thank God, hasn't uh, brought that many patients into the hospital. So I think they're getting concerned about how they're going to um, get up and get started again, too. So, but I, as far as county level health, I haven't really given it a lot of thought with everything else that's going on. I won't lie about it. Yeah, I have nothing to add, Dana. Um, so, Ben, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions here, and I know we talked a little bit about restarting the economy and what does that look like in a plan, but uh, digging into Randall's question here, uh, specifically he asked, um, within the plan uh, that when it does come forward, what industries do you see phased in first, second, and specifically do you have a suggestion uh, as we look to reopen our economy and how do we deal with different industries differently? And that's a question from Randall. I'm not sure that it's, I don't have a good answer in terms of what industry should go in first. I think it has more to do with the particular enterprise's capacity and their size. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I've given enough thought to think that there's one size fits all by industry, uh, but rather what's the capacity of each enterprise to put in place the measures that are needed to both meet the safety requirements and conduct their business. I, and and I, I take a look at that to, to add to that a little bit is, I'm not sure if this is, is a thing that this business will look for us. I mean, you know, we heard that golf courses are going to open up, but I think there's some simple things we can do to get a lot of businesses back open. Businesses can put a plan forward. I think we've got to trust in the people of the state of Maine to do the right thing. I have a lot of faith in the people in the state of Maine that they're not going to go back to um, just let a mob rule type thing. But I think there are ways that we can start to open up a lot of businesses in the state of Maine in a safe way. I mean, they got to put a plan forward. I'm not going to write a plan for how a restaurant should open its business. We all got our thoughts that they're going to limit the tables, spread the tables out, do some things, allow them to maybe move some tables outside. There's all sorts of things that have been laid out there, but we've got to have a little transparency. Um, there's got to have some flexibility from the state and local rules to maybe some extent so that businesses can meet the criteria to get people in and out safely. But I think there is a way that every business is going to kind of more or less have to write their own public safety plan and we got to rely on the people. I think the people of the state of Maine are smart enough to know if they're going into a place that's unsafe or not going into a place that's unsafe. And I think it becomes to a point that we need to um, put a little faith back in the people. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I'm, I'm glad the governor established this portal uh, through DECD that allows businesses to provide feedback. Again, I think that there, you know, Senator Timberlake just mentioned adding tables outside if you're a restaurant. Um, for, for a number of places, uh, there are restrictions on having seat, seating on sidewalks by, by a town, by town ordinance. So there's a lot of things that, you know, I think businesses would like to do um, in order to mitigate having people close in close proximity to, to one another as part of their plan for reopening. But it's going to, it's going to require um, some restrictions being temporarily lifted by municipalities, by the state. And so we need to know what those things are um, in order to make the necessary changes that allow for reopening plan business by business to make sense and to actually uh, work within the, the confines of, the, of, of either a town ordinance or, the, or state law. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope that those who are, are listening here on, on this call and those who um, aren't able to be on, on, this, on this Zoom call um, are thinking about those things um, now so that we can address them as quickly as possible, make the necessary changes that'll, that'll allow us to uh, hit the ground running when, when, when things are, are able to open back up. Um, I, I think there are a lot, of, a lot of simple things that can be done, like putting, uh, putting some seating outdoors 
Um, but we need to make sure that the restrictions that are sometimes in place for those things are, are, are lifted in order to do so. Yeah, I think those are all good points, um, good feedback. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to something I said earlier that, you know, the business owner knows their business best. And, um, you know, I think that's why it's critical to have them engaged in, in the process. And, you know, again, some sort of feedback group to be able to, to take it, uh, you know, to Augusta would be, I think, helpful. I think the portal is a good start. Um, but I think you're going to end up seeing another log jam there, just like we're seeing at DOL right now, um, where folks are just not, um, they can't, they're not able to get through. Um, but hopefully uh, this will be different. <laughs> I, I would add the following footnote because you've, you've all touched upon it is that I am keenly aware that the business sectors that, that are classified as non-essential, they are essential other than by definition, which we all know, but the, the, those who are essential have already established um, the criteria and are operating within those criteria. And I'm aware that that the other sectors that are classified as unessential currently, like your retail, like your restaurants, uh, your hospitality lodging, they've all taken up the task of creating criteria that, that would address many of the things that you said. So I think we're kind of at that, at that place in time where it just needs to be put together, analyzed and introduced, and certainly phased, uh, by a phased a gradual process, but clearly, I think you're all saying what we all believe in that we are at that very pivotal, important time to begin that process of, of reopening one way or another. So um, another question, um, Megan? I, uh, Gretchen Johnson says, what changes do you hope will persist? Greater regionalization, more flexible remote work arrangements, greater support of our local and smaller businesses. And then she goes on to say migration to more online access to resources, including healthcare and education. So what are your thoughts on changes that we've had to make because of COVID-19 that you hope will persist? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I've been sort of pondering for a while now, because as I said earlier, the sort of the creativity and the innovation that's already occurred um, has enabled some some of us and some of the businesses to continue to operate even during these tight restrictions that we're living under. And I, I think that's the sort of the million dollar question is what of, which of these adaptations are gonna prove durable as we move forward into the sort of reopening into a new world? And I, I don't really know. I think we're going to have to find that out, but I would say that she's identified some of the ones that I hope will persist in some form, the, <clears throat> sort of the greater regional, regionalization, the, the, you know, increased remote work that's happened. I mean, the rely, reliance on, you know, our technologies um, in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, I think there are certainly some of those things that will persist, and I hope will persist. I think the flexibility the, um, that people have had to bring to their operations, um, you know, I think all of that is, is valuable, and I'm hoping that in some form, it will, they will persist. And uh, my add on to that would be, I think we're about to see what a new normal is about to happen here. Um, you know, I look at my own businesses here. We have a farm stand that operates with a bakery and we have a hardware store that operates. Um, I tell my daughter, the one thing I'm scared of is we're never going to get away with home delivery now. Um, because her old man gets to be me who gets to do some of the deliveries. And I tell her I'm getting too old to handle 40 pound bags of grain anymore. I want to stay back at the farm, but I think it's something that's going to happen in the future. I think, um, We've seen it in our, in our farm stand with bakery boxes that we now are doing delivery with. It's a hard with, or I think every business in the state of Maine, uh, from, the, from the local insurance agency with their employees working at home, have, are gonna, some of the things they've tried work, some of the things they've tried aren't gonna work. So we're going to have a new normal. People are not gonna work when this is over exactly the way they were, but we're going to adapt. I think, and the same thing is gonna happen to the hotel and the restaurant industry in the state of Maine. 
I know a whole bunch of restaurants in my area that have gone to the takeout. I don't suspect takeout's going to go away for them. I suspect there will be some changes when it comes, but there are going to be some things that they've adapted and learned out of this process that will move Maine forward, hopefully in a good way, and we'll see what the new normal brings. It'll be interesting times <clears throat> in the future. Sure will. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add, you know, I've, I've been very thankful that uh, since I left Augusta back in March, I think I've gassed my vehicle up only, only once. Um, and, and I think I was actually saying this to a friend the other day. I think, I think a lot of folks um, are now realizing that they can work remotely at least, you know, part of the week. Um, and I think there will be a lot of uh, individuals who go back to their employers and probably request that they uh, get to spend a couple days uh, during the week working remotely from home versus going into – um, a brick and mortar location for, for, for their work. So, um, and I hope that's, I hope that's the case. I think there's a lot of good that comes from, um, being able to, uh, work remotely and having, having the opportunity to be at home, um, part of the week, including, uh, you know, including the fact that there are less vehicles on the road and, um, you know, we're, we're having a, a greater, uh, a, a less of an impact on, on the environment by, uh, not having to be, uh, on the road every day and on our roads by, um, not trampling upon them, uh, every day. So um, that's a change that, I, that I've quite enjoyed. And I hope that um, we can continue to find ways to allow folks to work uh, remotely moving forward. So again, I try to find the silver lining in all of this. Um, you know, I was putting a 1000 miles a week on my on my pickup truck uh, prior to this, and I'm now putting like less than one, uh, just to run <laughs> and back. I haven't filled up at all. I haven't used a quarter tank of gas since I've been home actually, which has been uh, really astonishing. Um, but so I, so um, to sort of square this circle, I go uh, to the University of Maine School of Law down in Portland. So my day looks like I commute back and forth between Augusta and Portland, go to class and then come back to Augusta, do session. On the weekends, I go home, right? So it averages about a thousand miles a week. So I've been a hundred percent online ever since then. They were able to make that transition one week right? From, from basically our spring break, uh, just happened to coincide. And then when we came back from spring break, all online. Um, so I was really anticipating prior to that, they didn't have a single online course offer, right? Which is the only law school in the state. And this is a microcosm of a much bigger, I think, phenomenon that, that has a potential to occur here um, in terms of a, a disruption to, to education and healthcare and a number of other industries as well. Um, but we've got to capitalize on it, right? And so it's sort of frustrating to now see that okay well in the fall semester we're going to go back 100 percent in the classroom not going to do anything online and i think that's the wrong approach right i think that we have to take um this opportunity right view it as an opportunity to learn as much as we can and then implement positive changes going forward um so i'm hoping that that you know if even if you know uh, we're allowed to go back into the, the physical classroom in the fall that there will still be opportunities for students, particularly rural students and folks in rural Maine, whether it's accessing telehealth uh, and telemedicine um, or whether it's accessing higher education. Um, if we have to go to Portland every week, it only works for me because I'm in the legislature, right? It doesn't work for the other, you know, 68,000 folks in the county. Um, so that's, that's what I'm hoping uh, the positive is from all this, that, you know, again, there'll be a silver lining here and we'll be able to make some positive changes forward. Linda. You have a question? Good morning, everyone. Um, it's from Corey King, um, and it is, um, are you aware of devastating staffing losses to local and regional chambers due to not being able, eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program? As of this morning, 55.9% of chamber staff have either been laid off or 27.9% have had their hours reduced. Chambers of Commerce are vital resources for businesses, and we are working hard to try and keep our businesses helped our businesses to find the right solutions. Is there any appetite for any state-sponsored loan programs that 501c6 or other nonprofits could be eligible for? Forgivable loans are nice, but even a one or two year learn, uh, term loan would work at this point, even for relatively low amounts. Hmm. Well, I, was, I have to confess, I was not aware of those particular numbers, uh, but they're not surprising. I suppose. Um, I've certainly been following some of the challenges people are having with the PPP and have been reading on some of the suggested fixes that are still possible for that. 
Um, I would say just locally, I was really pleased that the Bath City Council has voted to do its own small loan fund in which they included um, nonprofits as eligible recipients, just to add on to what's available to help people bridge this um, gap uh, that they're experiencing. And I think there's another one of my communities that's taking similar steps. So um, that's what I can add to that conversation. Um, it was glad to hear that, I'm well, not glad, but good to have that information. Senator Timberlake, any thoughts? Not sure that he heard me. Either frozen or he's napping. <laughs> <laughs> what shoes is frozen? <laughs> Representative Fecto? Any thoughts yeah, on that? Uh, like, like, like Senator Vitelli, I, I was not aware of uh, those particular numbers. And I, you know, I, I think for a lot of nonprofit organizations, obviously there's been a tremendous impact um, on their operations as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think you know, the legislature, the, the federal government needs to uh, definitely take a hard look about how we um, ensure that organizations that provide vital services to our communities um, are able to continue to function um, and, and providing those resources to, to our community. So, um, you know, I'm open. I, I definitely look forward to a conversation I, I suspect will probably be driven, uh, at least on this particular uh, question, by, uh, by organiz organizations like the State Chamber. And, um, you know, I think, I think it's obviously very important that, um, the, that these organizations have legs to stand on and that they continue to do um, the important work that's, that's before them, I know. For example, uh, Good Shepherd Food Bank, which has been providing um, food to community pantries across the state um, for, for a long time, but you know, has really been uh, called upon in a, in a bigger way, in a, in, a, in a more robust way as a result of the pandemic, um, has, has certainly um, been feeling the financial, the financial impacts of having so many, uh, and so many more individuals visiting uh, local food pantries and so we need to make sure that you know organizations like this like like Good Shepherd a nonprofit organization um, have the ability to to continue to do that work and that, that means they they're going to need funds to to do so that make up for the the loss uh, uh, that they're that they're expending on on the new demand so um, there's a lot of I think there's going to be a lot of organizations in a similar position um, if they if they aren't already um, and we all need to be cognizant of that and aware of that as leaders and and, and I hope that we can be um, a helpful partner in making sure that they um, are able to make it through this pandemic and continue the work that they do for our communities. Representative Stewart. Yeah, I don't have much to add, but you know, I'm on the board of a number of local nonprofits uh, here in town, uh, probably most notably the County Action Program. Um, they're, you know, we're all feeling it, right? Whether it's the Chamber or the CAFES, whatever, you know, United Ways. Um, so, um, certainly noted, um, I, I'm really hoping that in the next round, they, they've been doing a lot of rounds of, of uh, uh, the, through the CARES Act in Congress, hoping that at some point they'll be able to capture that as well. That would be the most sort of obvious place to make that, that change, uh, at least given us right now. Dana? Yes. Senator Timberlake is back. He was frozen, but we got him fixed. Oh, good. Great. So Senator Timberlake, uh, the question was, I don't know if you heard it or not, but had to do with local and regional chambers have, are classified as 501C6s, which means they can do some lobbying. Uh, and that's the distinction between that and 501C3s, which a number of nonprofits are. Nonprofits that are classified as 501C3s are eligible for the PPP program, 501C6s, are eliminated at the moment from any assistance. In spite of the effort, they were gonna be part of the uh, idle loan program, it never came to pass. Um, and they have been kind of the resource to reach out to local and uh, businesses to share with them information and resources. And the question that Corey had is, would the state be open to helping those local and regional chambers given their role in the state and the importance uh, role they play with businesses. Um, thank you, I, and I'm sorry for being locked out. I missed most of the discussion during that, but 
Um, I, I really wasn't aware that they was locked out uh, because I know that our local library and so forth had applied for the PPE and they'd got it. So um, I think it's something that is going to take some look into when we come back into session. I don't know if there's anything we can do now because we all know where revenues are in the state of Maine and where we're headed. So I don't know if I got an answer for that standing here right now. I think there are a lot of people that are in the same boat. Um, and I think the sooner we can get um, figure this, the safe way to get up and running <clears throat> the way we get this back. But I, I think there's, there's going to be avenues into the future from local towns and municipalities to do different things. Um, along the way that could that could help these organizations out and, um, but it's not something I'll be honest I hadn't given a lot of thought to at this point in time and I don't have some well believe it or not that hour has come and gone and we're a little bit past the intended time um, you've all been extremely forthcoming we appreciate it immensely I think as overwhelming as this challenge is and has been and continues to be, uh, as all of you have mentioned, there are some reassurances, for lack of a better word, um, positive qualities, perhaps is a better word, a couple words to describe it. And that is that we've seen a lot of creativity uh, on the part of people and businesses to address this issue. We've seen a real commitment to public health and to people and to one another. And the concern that's been expressed to help others is unquestionable. It is part of the main fabric. We all should be very proud of that. We are, we've seen ourselves go through this challenge in different phases. We are at that phase now that not sacrificing public health for a minute, but there is that need to address how, when, and in what form do we reopen uh, our economy? What does that take? How do we do it? And that is where we are today. And once again, it's not about a political party. It's about working together as we've seen so far and getting on with business. So with that, I thank you immensely. As I said at the opening, you carry the title of leaders, but I know you well enough to say that you would be whether you had that title or not. And we're very thankful that uh, you shared with us today your opinion, as well as looking forward to what we can expect. Thank you so very much. For all of you, we are grateful. Thank you for the invitation. Thank Good you. Thank you. Take care.